So here we go. All right, guys, this is week two of Married for Life. How'd y'all like last week? Pretty good? Pretty fun? Fantastic. Well, this week, whereas last week was about marriage by the book, part one, this was the 30,000 foot view flyover. This one is not flyover at all. This is in the weeds, nuts and bolts of what is God's design for you husbands and you wives. How in the world do we make marriage work? Last week in Marriage by the Book, part one, we reviewed some abysmal statistics regarding how bad marriage is going in the mainstream culture. 50% of all marriages are failing. Almost all are failing within that first eight-year period. Those who, uh, those who don't get divorced, that 50% that's kind of left over, well, they're experientially, you and I both know that a lot of times the fire goes out in those relationships. They end up not uh, passionately in love and best friends. They gravitate towards something like glorified roommates. God has a plan for marriage, though, and his plan is awesome. He's the one that made men, and he's the one that made women. He's like, hey, get together and make a bunch of puppies. It'd be great and fill the earth. Great times. It's all his plan, his design, and we have the opportunity to tell mainstream culture that they can have their false notions of how to do relationships, kick it to the curb, and instead bravely and boldly step into his design and watch your marriage take off. That's my heart, is for your marriages to absolutely flourish. Some of y'all may be in a place where I'm like, man, I'm, our marriage is not in a good spot. We're not having fun. This is difficult years and she does X, Y, Z, and I don't appreciate that, and he does A, B, C. I have to differentiate the letters there. It's not going well, and you need to figure out something to be able to get you off the track you're on and put you in a different lane. That's going to be God's path, and I'll go ahead and tell you, as the one who's delivering some of this stuff, some of the stuff in God's playbook you're just not going to like are postmodern ears that are itching for a pastor to stand up there, read the text, and then tell you what you wish it meant rather than what it actually does, some of it will be challenging. All of you will be challenged, and I will go ahead and tell you in advance, some of you are just not going to be able to accept what the Bible says. Some of you are going to uh, be tempted to reject God's plan, and you'll think that your plan is better that the world's plan is better. And I would just bring you back to those statistics and say, nope, marriage is going horribly wrong. Let's do it God's way. And let's just step out in faith to follow his command and just see what happens. See what happens. We're going to need a lot of prayer. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Uh, King Jesus, you are awesome. I pray that you'd be with me in the ministry of the word, that you would give me the boldness, the courage to speak truth. And you'd also allow me to articulate uh, your vision very, very well. I pray against the enemy that I would, uh, would not be misunderstood in any way as I am passing on uh, the um, playbook that you have given us. I pray against distractions and I pray for every man and woman in here, whether they're going to be married one day or whether they're married right now, that you would bless their marriage in an incredible way, in your name, amen. All right, let me hit you with an avalanche of scripture. Sound good? It's just a whole big, I feel like, man, I'm, I'm, I came two barrels locked and loaded, and I'm about to shoot you. So let's jump in. We're going to start with Genesis 2.18. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies go first. I'm going to talk about roles, responsibilities that God has for you ladies. And as I jump in here, you'll immediately be like, well, what about him? I'm getting to him. That's the second half. And so if all of a sudden you feel like, hey, he's picking on me. No, just ladies first. And then we're going to go after the husbands as well. So avoid nudging each other. No, I told you so. Eyes straight up here. Don't give them that look. And uh, let's, let's see, uh, let's uh, keep it up here. Uh, we're going to the scripture first. In Genesis 2.18, it says, Then the Lord God said, this is in the garden, It's not good that man should be alone. 
in perfect paradise and utopia, something was missing. All of creation was good, but it was missing one incredible thing, and that's you women, you girls. And he says, I will make him a helper fit for him. Ladies, your role within marriage is that of the helper. Not the leader, but the helper. That's different. That's God's design. You're the helper in your primary role, in your makeup, and in your commissioning. And I'm going to tell you why that's actually a really, really awesome thing that you should be very excited about. All right, uh, next verse, Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Pay attention there. Uh, for just like Jesus is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the wife. Submit to your husbands. That word submit in the Greek means submit. So, I mean, in our modern day, you're kind of like, all right, well, I don't like that word. Are you telling me to be submissive to my husband? I'm not. I'm not saying that at all. But God is. <laughs> be submissive to your husband. We also get the word subjugation or a subject. Uh, that is, he's leader and you're not. He is outranking you in that way. Wives, submit to your husbands as you would to Jesus. In the same way that we submit, uh, the church submits to Jesus, you should submit to your husband. Um, now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. That's Ephesians 5. Let's go to 1 Peter 3. Likewise, wives... Be subject to your husbands. There it is. Be subject to your husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. So you got a godly woman married to a bad man, uh, who is, or a man that is not a believer. The way to evangelize him and win him over um, is to submit to him anyway. Now, not following him in sin. The Lord's never going to have you follow your husband into sin. So if he is asking something that uh, contradicts scripture or conscience, you don't have to do any of that. But other than those examples, you're supposed to submit to your husband. And in so doing, you will blow his mind to such an extent, you'll be like, what in the, this woman is amazing. And he will lean into that. You may be the vehicle for his salvation, but it comes through your humility, not through you standing up for your rights, so to speak. That's not how you win a man. Uh, when they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external. This is a good message for culture. The braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with imperishable beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit. Feminists everywhere are shrieking in at the idea, a, a gentle and a quiet spirit. I can hear them now which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands. So as uh, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, uh, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. All right, in case I haven't won you over already, let's do even more scripture. Colossians 3.18, wives submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Notice the command that's given to the dudes. And remember, we're getting to the guys. I will give no mercy, no quarter regarding truth. So husbands are in the hot seat next. But notice the husbands are told to not be harsh with them. They're told to do that because they have the ability to be harsh. They are given the crown of leadership and you are not. Um, wives, submit to your husbands. Genesis 3.16 uh, now, this, this is going back to initial design. I will surely, uh, and what's happened is the fall has happened. The man is going to receive a curse. Satan will receive a curse. And the woman will receive a curse as well. So pay attention to this. I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. That's, just, that's not just that moment of giving birth. That is the entire process of raising a little kid up from 
crying baby needs something every 30 minutes and won't let you sleep in the middle of the night to terrorist twos and threes. I've re-nicknamed the terrible twos and threes to the terrorist twos and threes, mainly because of that boy right there. He did it. <laughs> He's a blessing and a joy, but holy cow, two and three years old was hard. And guess what? The Lord has increased the difficulty in our child uh, rearing and pain you shall bring forth children. Now, check it out. Your desire will be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Your desire is to not follow your husband's leadership, what your husband says. Instead, your desire will be to subvert that authority, to not submit, and to not follow his rule. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. All right, so ladies probably pretty upset at the mailman right now. All I did right now, I just read a bunch of scripture. And this is called systematic theology when I'm like, all right, what does the entire Bible have to say about one specific topic? Mainly the role and position of a wife in a marriage. And that's it. I just did a whole bunch of scripture so that there is no possible way anyone could twist it or mismanage it so it would be what you wish it said. Philosophically, it must be so that one takes the more senior ranking leadership. 50-50 leadership literally doesn't work. It doesn't work. You can have the president, you have one CEO of a corporation, one. Do you know what you have when you have two CEOs? You have a going out of business sale. That's what you have. You have one lead coach of a sports team, just one. You have one steering wheel in a car. You have one president of the United States. Could you imagine if Trump and Biden were co-presidents? It's already going terrible. <laughs> Co-president, it doesn't work. And then we're like, okay, though you can't point to any of these huge institutional metaphorical examples of leadership and you're like, no, 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 50-50 doesn't work. But all of a sudden we come to the most important one, the one that all society rests on and be like, yeah, but 50-50. You vote, he votes, it'll be good. We'll just compromise on everything. And guess what? That doesn't work. Think of a steering wheel in a car. Your steering wheel, if you had two steering wheels in your vehicle on the way here, what would have happened? Yeah, you, it's Christian said it, you would die. You would arrive here dead. So you would not be here. Now it could be you're on the interstate and you got the feeling of like, no, 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 kind of like 50-50 compromise. We both got our steering wheels. I'm like, all right, you straight, babe? I'm like, I'm straight, good to go. I'm like, oh, this is great. And as long as you're on the interstate and no one's around you and no one slams on brakes and you don't have to veer off, you're good. But the moment you have any immediate decision, any crisis point, any big conflict going on, you really need one person steering the car and the other person helping them, right? You got one person with the wheel and the other person can be calling out obstructions. They're navigating, they're swatting the kids in the back, doing whatever, but it's like, all right, baby, you and me, team effort, but there's one steering wheel, got it? And where if I can get input, ultimately, I gotta make the decision. You understand? It must be so 50-50. Now in our day and culture, uh, the wife is typically in, charge. She is ruling. Now, I think it's a fallacy to, to believe really under the hood of any marriage that it is 50-50. Really, somebody is actually leading that ship. You just pretend it isn't so. Oftentimes, in our day and age, we're the most feministic culture that has ever walked the earth. We're in our third wave of feminism, and as such, women have really seized control and the authority position in marriages. Uh, men being beaten down and women being encouraged to rise up. It's like in every kid's movie for the last 20 years. Is It used to be the princess was rescued from the dragon by the prince. That hasn't happened in decades in Disney movies. Have you noticed? Nope, the princess, she like knows karate and she doesn't need a man helping her and she can rescue herself and he's kind of dopey and he means well and she ends up teaching him lessons and she rescues him. You know, every single cartoon from that, like the modern Rapunzel one, what was that? Tangled, Tangled or the Shrek movies of like all these She-Ra women don't need men, they're in charge, you don't need rescuing and that culture has really risen up, right? 
In most of our movies, the guys are kind of dopey and dumb, and the wife and kids teach them a moral lesson at the end. Right now, I'm thinking about Tim the Tool Man Taylor, and he was supposed to be like oh, oh, this bastion of masculinity, but he's always kind of an idiot. He's the village clown. Everyone's laughing at him, and though he likes tools, he's an idiot, and everyone's teaching him a lesson at the end of it. This is not a man leading. He happens to like tools and sports. And that's the only thing masculine about him. And it's the most superficial one that I don't give a flying rip about. Women have seized control over most marriages by uh, a, a number of different weapons in y'all's arsenal. Uh, one is nagging. Nagging is incredibly powerful. Women can seize power in a marriage by nagging. Uh, that's asking the same thing over and over and over again. Nope, eyes up here. Don't, no nudging, none of that. Oh, we got to well, really stay here because uh, I want to encourage y'all, but I got to call out the lie so I can exhort us to the truth, right? And the truth is actually beautiful and women, you'll love it. And I'm not going to let your husbands weaponize this sermon on you later either. So I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Trust me. Trust your pastor. I adore you all, but don't nag. Nagging is asking the same thing over and over again until you wear husband down so he ultimately does what you want. This could be questions, death by interrogation. Questions, questions, questions. Hey, are you going to do the thing? Are you going to do the thing? Well, I asked you two, three weeks ago and you should have done the thing. I'm like, you just keep bringing it up. Ultimately, that chips away at the resolve of a man until we're ready to die. This happened to the strongest man of the Bible. It was Samson. And Samson was nagged by Delilah until he despaired of life. The strongest man in the Bible could not handle the nagging of this woman. That's the strongest man in the Bible. The wisest man in the Bible, Solomon, said it's better to live on the corner of a roof than with a nagging wife. He lived in a palace. He lived in a palace. And he said, no, no, nagging woman, I would la rather live on the corner of someone else's roof than live with the naggy presence. It's terrible. It's awful. It's miserable. And through nagging, you can wear a man down until he is a shadow of himself and he's just ready to do it. whatever. Yep, whatever. I just, I don't want to fight about it anymore. Whatever you say. Sky's pink. Great. It's pink. I just don't want to fight anymore. Uh, through nagging, you can absolutely dominate your husband. My wife could absolutely dominate me. I'm a masculine guy. I promise you, if she wanted to seize the crown, she wanted to be the authority in our marriage, I have zero doubt she could. She could. She could outlast me emotionally. Uh, however, our marriage isn't built like that. We had to figure out how in the world we were going to build our marriage early on. In our first couple years, not really having a good example to look to, we had to really dive into Scripture and be like, what kind of marriage do we want? And this was very hard from her because she saw the plan for marriage, and it was, frankly, it was terrifying for her to submit to me. What if I'm harsh? What if I'm cruel? What if I ask her to sin? You know, what if she's just this battered woman emotionally and she's not allowed to speak and she's just in kind of the, you know, whatever, hoop dress, making sandwiches, beleaguer, you know, like, what if, what if, what if? It's scary to be able to trust your entire happiness to this man and say, I'll follow you even when I disagree with you. I won't nag you. Uh, I won't force my way. I won't use sex to manipulate you. I won't manipulate through crying to get my way. You've ever seen this? Ladies, some of you would bashfully smile if I asked you if you ever got out of a, part, a speeding ticket. You just turn on the waterworks, you cry, and you play on that inclination of a dude and be like, all right, I'm sorry, ma'am. You may go. You just, you can turn that on. You're clearly in the wrong with your husband. You did wrong. And then you just fall to pieces. And that uh, compassion piece of him of like, no, no, it's ba baby, it's okay, it's okay. You know what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He didn't do anything. I'm like, I'm so sorry. But you turned on the waterworks and you're like able to manipulate in that way. Sometimes it's kind of fits of anger as well. You just fly off the handle, get real mad until you get your way. There's a lot of different ways that a woman, if she decides to, can dominate a man. And I will go ahead and submit, even as 
I've got the pointy Leonidas beard and I was a formal spe former special operations veteran. She could dominate me if she wanted to. She could do it. And she has to choose to submit to me anyway, even if I don't deserve it, just because, no, this is God's design and she's going to do marriage God's way. And that's really hard. Uh, my wife was raised as a strong and independent woman. Now, I really like the strong part. I, I need a strong helper, and that's what I got. You feel so uncomfortable. You want me to point over here, like pretend you're over here just to get the spotlight off? I love you, baby. I got to go here because it's the example. We talked about this, you know? All right, so she is so, so strong. And I'll go ahead and concede she's much stronger than me in other ways. That makes us a wonderful team because instead of me failing for my weaknesses, all my weaknesses get filled in by her strengths. And so we make this dynamic, awesome power couple because she's strong. But the independent part isn't good. Independent women don't make for good marriage partners. Independent men don't either. Because the whole point of marriage is oneness. It's to come together so you're not two anymore, you're one. And in the becoming of one, you, you start to rely on each other heavily. This woman who can level me with the look of her eyes now is by far the most powerful person in the room and the most powerful person in my life in the world. The whole world can disagree, but if my wife is behind me, I'm ready to charge a machine gun bunker. I don't care. She, she's the wind under me. You know, I'm like, I am ready to go. And so she's able to um, do that. But marriage is about oneness. You don't want to be highly independent of each other. So if you're like, I don't need a man, you're the modern fairy tale growing up, uh, as Disney would put it forth, the warrior princess who needs no saving. I don't need a man. I'm like, well, no, I need my wife and she needs me. That's, that's the whole point. And if we've spent the last 15 years of our lives growing up toward a marriage, all of a sudden to, to bring that attitude into a marriage so that we're not relying on each other and knitting ourselves together, well, that's a big problem. You're going to have all kinds of emotional walls up and relational walls uh, so that you're not going to make a good spouse. Now, let me issue a warning. There's something horrible at stake if you were to seize the mantle of authority. You know, gals, um, you know how you can kind of steer your husband to get your way. You know how to do that, but I'm, let me warn you some, about something. If you henpeck him and you subtly steer that ship, that man, the way you want him to, slowly bit by bit, as with a chisel, you are making him more and more passive. As he becomes more passive, he drifts into a shadow of the full-bodied man he's supposed to be. You thought you wanted a leader, but then when he started leading, you realized, I want to be in charge. And then you chipped away at him until he was neutered. And now you don't respect him anymore. And as soon as your respect for him goes away, your attraction to him goes away. And once you're not attracted to him anymore, well, then the joy, his joy is gone and your joy is gone. And now it's misery and it's mutually assured destruction. Got it? There is a terrifying result of taking away from him his God commissioned ordination to lead your family. Very, very bad stuff. You don't want to do that. So instead, you lean into the role of the helper that you were born to. My wife is the best counselor I have. Uh, anytime I'm at any point of impasse, I'm going to her to advice. I mean, her fingerprints are even all over this sermon as I'm consulting with my wife to figure out how I can do this. I'm like, all right, maybe this is hard truth. I've got this. And she's like, oh, don't say it like that. And instead, she's like, ah, oh, do this example right there. And then she gives me some encouragement. And then her encouragement means the world to me as well. And so she gives me good counsel. She gives me essential encouragement. I'm ready to go out my door in the morning and conquer the world because my wife's behind me. She's with me. She's for me. And I feel so encouraged and empowered. I'm ready to go 
uh, protect, provide, and do all the things that I need to. Uh, it is her care as helper that allows me to have all needs met, and now I'm able to do what I'm called to do. She also is the one that provides rest. I'll tell you, for my part, I always just want to be home. I travel a lot for work. I get to travel to some good places, but unless my wife and my kids are with me, I typically, no matter how cool the destination is, after a day or two, I really just want to be home. I want to be home all the time. I love my home. My home is my favorite place to be. I just want to be home. I, I'm now I'm, I'm begging the point, but I really mean it. I'm like a broken record now. I love my home. I love my home because, man, I feel that in my veins. Why? It's because my helper has made a house into a home and she's made it this oasis, this restful place. When I come home, she's waiting on me uh, and she's got whatever she's got going on in her life. And, um, and I feel loved and I feel welcomed and I feel this is a place of peace and she has made this a home and we just love being together. This morning we took a walk uh, through the woods together, just holding hands. And I didn't plan on telling you that, but I'm just letting you know if that, that's my home and that's my wife. Uh, my helper uh, has made it so. Uh, wives, as the helpers, you have immense amounts of power. You have the ability to give life or death to your husband, life or death to your kids. You can make him stronger or you can whittle him down to a shadow of who he is supposed to be. Make no mistake, he has a certain amount of power in his roles and responsibilities, but so do you. You can completely change who he is. You can give him wings. You can put fire in his heart and send him out to go conquer whatever challenge may meet him. And he's going to be coming home ready to adore you. But I'm getting into the marriage piece now. Last scripture I want to share with you uh, is out of Titus 2 verses three through five. Now already notice how when the curse came in early Genesis, God cursed the woman and her child rearing. You ladies, you were equipped to make babies and then even feed babies and then nurture them up to adulthood. That's incredible. Naturally, biologically, you are the better nurturer and by design, you are better nurturers. You're the ones that make a house a home. And so Bible is pointing out in your main calling, which is to be homeward oriented. It's the rearing of children and the um, relational cultivation of a marriage as the helper. That's the main calling. So you notice the curse that God gave you hit you toward your primary role and responsibility at home, raising a family and keeping that family unit healthy and flourishing. That's your primary uh, Titus 2 says it clear. Older women, likewise, you're to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to too much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. This is a good admonition of like, no, no, no. You don't, we shouldn't be separating out by all like age groups. Younger women seek out older women. They have wonderful wisdom to share. Older women seek out younger women they're going to keep you on their toes, remind you of a bunch of good stuff, and they're going to keep you moving. They're going to keep you active, and, and uh, their youth can be such an, um, a moving forward ambition. They'll put a spring in your step. Uh, young folks are awesome. Uh, let's see. You're teaching young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Uh, now, it is helpful to just note that though you're nurturers and you're helpers, that doesn't mean that I am not also. It's just helpful to kind of think about men and women and their respective roles as I major on something and you major on something else. And I minor on something. I minor as a nurturer. I'm primarily protector, provider, leader, lover. But protector, provider, those are kind of some key things that I major on. My wife is also a protector and provider of sorts. She minors on that. It's still her role, but it's a minor role. I'm also a nurturer. When my sons or my wife 
is having a big issue, they don't need me to be, you know, logical taskmaster, whatever. They need me to get on the floor with them, just listen, hear them out, uh, weep with them, maybe feel it and don't fix it necessarily. Do the dude thing and just, nope, let, let's be, let's go deep down into what, what our hearts are telling us and unpack that. We need to nurture. You know, sometimes it's still like no, no time for words. This is time to just hug and sway. That's it. It's going to be all right. And I want to be nurturing. That's part of my job. I want to be romantic. Uh, that's actually a primary job for dudes. But anyway, we both major and minor on the same stuff. It's just reversed. I major on what she minors on. I minor on what she majors on. So it's, it's overlapping responsibility. I'll talk in a moment about, well, what, how's this work with working outside the home? And we have a lot to unpack there, and we just don't have a ton of time. But I'll say, yeah, some of that maybe of like, hey, he's out working, and you're working too. It's primarily his responsibility to pay for the bill, pay the bills. But man, in today's economy of like, inflation is wild out of control. If y'all been to the grocery store, it's extremely difficult to make ends meet. And it may be just a matter of family survival that your family has opted that the missus is also getting out and earning some as well. Now she's also got other responsibilities. And so when it comes to earning, dudes, you bring home the bacon, you major on that and she may minor on it. She's helping with that, but she's got other responsibilities as well. Dudes, just because you went out and worked doesn't mean you get to come home, kick your feet up and do nothing until it's time to go to work tomorrow. I'm like, no, 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 Let, let's, let's roll up our sleeves and baby, what do you need some help with? Actually, when I first come in, I'm like, no, put my stuff down. Nobody asked me anything for 20 minutes. And then, all right, I got a second win. I have transitioned. Now I'm ready to help. And so that's just kind of how I am. And my family knows that. I want to be greeted. I want to put down my bag. And then I just need to decompress. And then I'm ready to have like, what are we doing? Oh, she's whipped. Mondays are hard days. She's been teaching. Kids have been a little crazy. Would you grill tonight? I'm like, you betcha. Kick, your, kick up your feet. I got this tonight. And now I'm grilling and I'm helping and I'm serving and I'm taking care of ninos and stuff. So understand that there's overlap. Maybe she wants to get out of the home and she wants to do some work. Great. Uh, and maybe you're helping with uh, um, uphold some of the chores and the needs of the household. Great. There is always overlap. Y'all follow me? Our desire was, and we did this years ago, was that um, to, to really keep with homeward oriented, that we would be a single income family. And that ended up being wildly difficult for us. Uh, in our modern day of keeping up with the Joneses, we tend to accidentally live far more luxuriously and comfortable than the kings and queens of old with all of our modern amenities. And we start to think that no longer you have to live like this. You have to have all the coolest stuff and to buy like a 70,000 vehicle that you finance for seven years and you're just killing yourself to pay. You felt like, yeah, no, I needed the nicest stuff. And I'm like, man, we had to really downsize. We, embarrassingly enough, I had two kids and I moved out of a house into a tiny little apartment, communal living. And that was a little humiliating for me as a man, you know, and, but we wanted to homeschool. We wanted to be single income. And for us, it meant making a radical change that none of our friends were doing. None of our friends at that station in life were doing that. And we had to bear the judgments of like, wait, wait, y'all live, oh, you live in an apartment? Okay, little, little apartment building. I'm a grown man with a couple kids. And most of my friends weren't, weren't doing that. They had, they had houses. We'd come from a house. Uh, but that's just something that we did. Now, there may be no nugget in this for you. I'm just giving something a little bit biographical to say, hey, th those were tough times. And we had to put our heads together and figure out, like, hey, how do we avoid keeping up with the Joneses so that we can really lean you into what you would like to do and uh, me as well. It may not be realistic right now for y'all to be a single income family so that she could fully lean into her role and be more homeward oriented. That may not be, but could you downshift size of life a little bit and she turns that dial down a, a few hours a week as well so, so that she can really realize the homeward oriented more. Maybe there's a, a few year plan that you could offload that or maybe you're happy just the way you are. Wonderful, great. So you could do that. You get to decide how your household runs. All right, dudes, good? 
Everybody happy still? Kind of, sort of? Girls are like... I don't want to talk about it. All right, men, love your wives. Ladies, this is why submitting to your husband shouldn't actually be a very big deal. It's because of the follow-up. It's because of what the parameters that God sets for the men around it. Here it is. Men, love your wives. Let's do an avalanche of scripture as well. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What did Jesus do for the church? Gave his life for the church and then died for the church. So guys, in the same way that Jesus didn't put his own needs ahead of the church, but instead emptied himself, served, worked huge hours, and walked across the country many times and preached and got beaten and then ultimately crucified. That's the kind of way that you love your wife, selflessly. Love your wives. Um, and as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. We want our wives to be sanctified in the Lord. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. There's some great words. Love has some teeth on it. Nourish your wife. Cherish your wife. This is where all the chivalric code came from. This is, we desire to not treat our wife as an equal or even lower. I've been given leading uh, authority here to take my wife and exalt her up. I'm going to open the door for her. I'm going to serve her. I'm going to unpack this even more, but I'm getting, I'm getting into my points when I should just be reading scripture. So somebody say, John, stay on track. All right, and just settle down. Just easy. <laughs> Likewise, and uh, let's go to another scripture, 1 Peter 1, 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Uh, a weaker vessel. If you didn't notice, because of a magical little thing called testosterone, we are stronger than you, ladies are. We're not built the exact same thing. Uh, our deadlifts are bigger. We will win fights, uh, and you can make babies, and that's amazing. Way to go. We're built different. Surprise. This is shocking. Do y'all see all the men competing in women's sports? I just saw another one of those come down my feed this morning where these girls are working hard to be able to be the best swimmers, the best runners, and then a failed athlete from the men's arena who places like number 5,462, all of a sudden comes in and breaks the women's records, steals the trophy, and the girls are left holding the bag, so to speak. I'm like, man, the, what cowardly dudes. Uh, but anyway, we see the result. Why is that happening? It's because men are stronger. Men are stronger. That shouldn't be offensive, you know? Like if I had preached that at any age other than ours, in any point in history, you'd be like, guys are stronger than girls. They'd be like, yeah. All the girls are like, yeah, he's stronger. Pickle jar stuff. You know, you're up, slugger. <laughs> yeah, of course. Dudes are stronger. It's okay. But in our day and age, the feminists shriek. No! Women can do everything men can. And men, but men can't do everything women can. Double standard. Yay, feminism. Let's go to, um, nope, uh, Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Dudes, you're supposed to be the leader. You're supposed to be shepherding your wife. It's not a 50-50 vote. Here, you're actually given the mantle and commissioned by God to be the one in charge of the relationship in that the buck stops with you. It doesn't make you mean that you're not a team, but more keeping with what's called in the, uh, theological circles complementarianism, like one left hand and a right hand serving and working together. That's the teamwork, but you got the tiebreaker there. The dude is actually the one in charge. Now, you don't use that mantle of authority to be harsh with your wives. You shouldn't be domineering. Remember, this is a bride 
who pledged her whole earthly happiness for as long as you both shall live under your protection and your authority. Just like her, uh, th this is the symbolism of a marriage. The father walks the bride down the aisle. And the pastor asked, who gives this woman? I do. And then the headship of the father transfers that of the husband. And she takes his last name. She is transferred the headship of dad to headship of husband. You understand? That, that, that's, that's how it works. We don't use this authority to be harsh with our wives. Instead, we should be gently leading them. Our leadership should be something uh, that is a pleasure to follow. We should be having lots of fun in our marriages. You should be making lots of memories. We should be romantic. Your leadership should include adoring her and being patient with her. Here's a free tip for you young married people. Women, oftentimes when they come to you with a problem, they don't actually want you to fix it. And this is amazing. This took me like 15 years to realize. They don't want me to fix it. They just want me to listen and say, mm, I am so sorry, baby. And then they'll say a little bit more. And this, again, I'm like, oh, I really want to tell her what to do. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And I'm just going to hear, and she just got to get it out. She wants me to feel it and not fix it. And sometimes I'll get confused. I'm like, do you want me to feel it or fix it? And she's like, just feel it. And I'm like, I can do that. I can feel it. But dudes, we're fixers. And sometimes in our desire to lead and fix it and uh, logic out the problem and solve it, we miss our wives' hearts. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to connect us. And so not being harsh, but instead living with her in an understanding way, adoring her, being romantic, being patient with her, we are not domineering and we're not harsh. Now there's one extreme of dudes can be domineering and harsh. And so some of us in the room, we've been too harsh with our wives. I have, I have this in my rear view mirror. When we first started, I was out of military. I was a war veteran. I was a leader, uh, kicking down doors, hunting terrorists for a living. That was my job. And now I'm like, and I'm married now. And the Bible says I'm in charge. Oh, so let me be in charge. <laughs> Man, uh, if you ever feel like you need to stand up and be like, I'm in charge, you're not in charge. <laughs> and you're certainly not a good leader. And see how that works out for you. You have to follow me. The Bible said, I'm like, man, buckle up. Have fun with that. The only way she's going to submit to you isn't by you demanding it, gents. It's by you leading inspirationally and her choosing to submit. If she doesn't choose it for herself, you're not going to make her do it. And to even try is folly. So next time you get in a fight, don't pull out the, I'm in charge. <laughs> nope, don't do that. You want, don't be passive though. Don't be harsh. Don't be passive. Passive is when we just stop trying to lead. It's when we give up the ghost. It means we not, we're not fighting for our marriages anymore. You just, it's not worth it anymore. I don't want to fight. Yeah, sure. Whatever you want. And dudes end up retreating from their marriage, letting her just, oh, I don't, it's not worth the fight. You figure it out. I'm going to grab a snack. I'm going to melt into the sofa and I'm going to watch my favorite sports team and I'll get sucked up and lost in that or video games or social media or your work. You just a workaholic. Why? Because you don't want to be around your wife. You, you don't want to be home. It's not a restful place. And so you go to work because at least there you got a mission and you find some fulfillment there of like, no, what's happening is you're passively hiding from greater conflicts. And what may need to happen is you actually got to battle it out a little bit. You've got to be able to get back in your marriage and you got to be vulnerable and you got to have uncomfortable conversations uh, and uh, be able to hash it out. Some of us men where I've, I've had to repent of harshness and even to this day, sometimes with 17 years in and we're doing, our marriage is going very, very well and she's flourishing and so am I. Uh, I still will have moments where I'm like, nope, that was harsh. And I got to come back in and I'm like, I am upset. I took it out on you and you don't deserve that. I'm sorry. I just need some space. And then that's it. 
And then 30 minutes later, I'm kind of like, I was awful. <laughs> and then we have a moment. We both laugh and we kind of move on. And it ain't, it's just the highs and lows of humanity as we're working through this thing called life towards sanctification to be more like Jesus so I'm not harsh with her at all. Next year, I, I, I never want my voice raised to my wife. You know, I, I, I don't want that. I, I'm, I'm not a brute and I'm trying to love her like Jesus loved the church. Jesus isn't yelling at the church or dominating the church or having his way. Um, so instead, Jesus commands men to love their wives and follow his example through servant sacrificial leadership. This is a cool verse. And dudes, I need y'all to really lean in to John chapter 13 because this shows us a picture of what your role is and my role is as the leader in the home. Ladies, you should love this. If you were mad at me, you shouldn't be mad at me anymore because I'm landing your plane right here on John 13. So you're welcome. I'm so glad we're friends again. Y'all are amazing. All right, here we go. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, then poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. That is a really cool leadership. And that is the leadership that we're called to. Gents, we were given the mantle of authority and leadership. And what does the king of the universe do with his, author uh, with his authority here? It says, Jesus, knowing all things were under his authority. He had just been made supreme executive commander of the cosmos. And so Jesus grabs a towel and washes his disciples' dirty, poopy feet. Like, wow! Supreme authority washes feet. That is how we love our wives. They respect us and revere us and honor us and submit to us, being the helper, not being the head, but allowing us to be the head and we're in charge. And we, moved by the gesture and understanding how Jesus led, we adore our wives, we cherish our wives, and we serve our wives as leaders. Servant leadership. My goal in marriage is to make her life much better and much easier than my life is. If I was built stronger, that means I am going to outwork her. I'm going to take on a little bit more chores as well so that she can kick up her feet a little early. Why? Because I'm built strong to do it. I've been given strength for a reason. And what I want to do with that as a servant leader, I want her life better than mine. I want her life easier than mine. I want her to always have a more expensive car than me. It will always be so. It has always been so. She is going to decorate her nest, her home, exactly like she wants it. She knows that now. She didn't consult me what picture she's getting and where it's going. My job's just to hang it on the wall. She has her way, right? And this is one silly way to me that I can serve her and love her. It's servant leadership. We have a massages budget to get massages and they all go to her. I get none. <laughs> she gets chiropractor and massages. I don't do, I also don't want anyone touching me but my wife, but she gets the whole budget. Um, shopping time. Sometimes it's just, man, I want to bless this woman. She is amazing. You look, oh, you look like you need some new clothes. Do you need new clothes? She does. Get out of this house. I got the boys and let's send her out. Um, and uh, now it's like, well, but keep it, keep it below this, babe. <laughs> Biden said, hold my beer. I'm like, whoa, easy. <laughs> I want to spend more money on her than I do on myself. Uh, I recognize she has hard days and, you know, keeping up with the entire meal schedule of growing boys that eat everything. It's a great thing when I can just fire up the grill and I'm cooking dinner. Say aside, I got this, babe. Uh, in the mornings, I'm on coffee duty. I'm making her coffee. 
uh, errands to run, no problem. I will run your errands. Uh, where we eat, I typically don't care. I just want a decision. I don't want 12 options. I just want you to make a decision. I'm thrilled with everything, but I want you to eat wherever you want. Um, what we watch, I usually don't care. I just want to be with her. Uh, so all kinds of different ways where I can say, all right, not my desire, but your desire. I want you to have more than me because it's not a 50-50 contract kind of thing. You were given authority to cherish, to nourish, to lead her, to selflessly sacrifice for her. And so, ladies, a question, and I want you to answer. Do you mind following that kind of leader? Some of you gals who are kind of like, I don't like this sermon. Now you're like, nope, sign me up. That's great. If my husband's doing that, I will follow you to the brink. Where are we going, babe? I'm on mission with you. And that is amazing when uh, the wife falls in her role and the man falls in her, his role, you both get to become more of who you were designed to be. And what happens is you as an individual and you as a couple flourish in an incredible, powerful way. And the witness sends this ripple effect out to everyone else that doesn't understand how you do it. My wife has a honey-do list for me. Any of you dudes, y'all have honey-do lists? It's a list of chores. Maybe it's written, probably it isn't, but you have things that you, she expects you to do. Do you have a honey-do list for her? You probably don't. I have the honey-do list. She has things for me, and I'm going to do her honey-do list. I don't make real honey-do list stuff for her, but she does for me, and I'm, accept I'm like, nope, I'm ready to serve. Bring it on. Now, it's not that her wish is my command. Some of the answers are like, yeah, I'm not going to get to that. Or if I do, it's going to be a while. Or I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, but I need it done right now. I'm like, mm, I'm, I'm busy. Uh, give me 30 minutes. And I'll, so it's not like wish is my command. Some of you will feel like, oh, nope, you got to serve me how I want. I'm like, no, you're, you're trying to boss him around like he's your little vassal. You're like, oh, nope, serve me. I'm the queen. I'm like, yes, you're the queen, but he's the king. Right? And so you're not bossing each other around. It's out of a desire and love to sacrificially serve my wife. I'm doing the honey-do list chores. It may not be exactly what, what uh, when, or what. And if I haven't agreed to it, I might not do it because uh, I don't have to do everything. But it is my desire to serve that I'm doing it. Is that helpful? I'm just trying to be very real up here. It'd be a lot more spiritual if I left that whole diatribe off and just says, I'll do whatever she tells me to do. I'm like, well, now you're not leading and you've given her carte blanche to order you around like a slave. And she thinks she'd want that until she gets that. And then that's not going to work very well at all. Uh, let's see. Um, next thing for dudes. Uh, I already mentioned this a little bit when I was talking about helper and homeward oriented for the gals. Uh, but one of your main callings is as that of a protector and a provider. Uh, in Genesis 3.17, you see the curse that fell to the man. It says, Cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Whereas the woman was cursed in the raising and nurturing of kids, because she's supposed to be homeward oriented, you are cursed by the sweat of your brow and the work of your hands. Work is going to be hard. It's going to be a complex Rubik's Cube that's going to make you sweat uh, and bleed over it. It is going to be difficult to provide for a family. That's going to be a hard task. And so understand, dudes, you are meant to do good work. Provide for the needs of your family. Second Timothy, I forgot what chapter says, if a man does not provide for the needs of his own family, he's denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. Men, you're called to provide for your family. Provide for your family. Get out, hunt, kill, right? Um, again, it may be in your household, a dude, a single salary home, like almost all of our great uh, grandparents and our great grandparents, they were almost all, almost all single income families that started to shift with the baby boomers. That that's my parents' generation. Now women are starting to get careers and it's woman empowerment. And that's great women. You can have careers and you can 
do the thing. Yeah, go ahead. You can do careers. Unfortunately, a lot of women found out too late, especially when biological clocks started ticking. You get 30, 34, 35, and you really, all of a sudden, this mad scramble to have kids, and then you get kids, and then you realize, I just want to be with my kids. And you were somehow sold the feministic lie that it was better to work for the man, nine to five, that employer, than it was to serve your husband and raise kids who you adore. Somehow the nine to five is better than your calling, your family, your children, your, your legacy. You know, your dudes, a lot of the times, your nine to five in 50 years from now, no one's going to remember how many units of whatever you made and whether you had a sales record in the month of November or any of that. It's all going to be gone. But the legacy of the woman who poured her life out for her kids is going to continue to go. Who's to say that her impact and her legacy isn't far greater than you at your job working to make money? Really, I've, I want to make money so I, I can get back to what's even, most important, and that's my family. I want to be with my family. And she gets to do that. I missed the first steps of my second son. Ugh, I, was, I wished I'd been there. I wasn't there. I was working. I missed a, a good bit of stuff. I'm out working. And she got to enjoy that. And, and that's wonderful. Good for her. Uh, it is my mantle. I'm going to miss some of that stuff as I'm supposed to go out and serve my family in working hard. I'm uh, closing um, with one more point and then I'll kind of wrap everything up. So men love your wives. Decision making. How does decision making work? Guys, as the leader, you are accountable and responsible for all. So if your wife has a failing and something that's really under her dominion, that's your fault. Doesn't matter. The leader is responsible for everything, uh, meaning the buck stops with you. Uh, but in my household, and I think in all households, decision-making should fall into one of three buckets. Uh, one bucket is I decide. Uh, this is oftentimes the stuff that's kind of outside of the house. Uh, this is insurance. This is contracts. This is 401k. This is paying the car bills and all the bills in general. And in my home, I do all the bills and the accounting and my wife doesn't, she doesn't care. Um, then the second bucket, she decides. I don't know what they're doing for homeschool uh, tomorrow. I, I have no idea what her budget is for all the food that we're going to be eat. I'm sorry, uh, what she's going to be getting for the household as she's uh, preparing meals for the house and anything else that she's doing. She has all kinds of dominion over, um, over that. So I decide, she decides, or the third bucket is we decide together. That can be uh, challenging. And this is where we put our heads together and we make the best decision we can. All this works very well. Your family has the same thing. Dudes, you're making some decisions just by yourself. That's just part of what you do. She's doing the same thing. And then on other stuff, you come together and decide. The real big difficulty is returning to kind of the steering wheel metaphor. What do you do when you reach an impasse? What do you, re what do, you do when you completely disagree on something? Well, men, ultimately, when you reach a complete disagreement, you've got to make the call. And it may be that you go with her on this. I'm like, she seems far more passionate about this. I am not sure what the right thing is. Let's go with what you're saying, baby. And she's go, I'm, I'm going to go with your advice and your counsel on this. Or it may be the opposite way. Whatever it is, though, both of you have to agree once the decision has been made, whether ladies you get your way or dudes you get your way, you both jump on board as if it was your original idea and it's no I told you so's. That's not, that's not a good respectful way. There's no nagging of you should have done the other thing. It's nope, all right, this is the direction. Uh, and even if I didn't agree with it, that's the decision we're going to go forward with today. That's how we're going to do it. Now, uh, there was one, way, uh, one decision I was thinking about before, um, before I got in here today, my wife brought it up to me, uh, where my wife and I were at an impasse. We had spent a year on a foreign mission field and we weren't very well prepared, and we had um, some church hurt and some problems, 
And man, going back on the mission field for a second year, we did not want to. We didn't want to. We were hurt and we were ready to just like, nope, n no more of that. But there was a problem. I believe that the Lord was not done with us on that mission field. And I had to tell her that. I'm like, baby, the Lord has not released us this. We are supposed to go back for a second year. And she's like, nope, I can't. I won't. I'm like, baby, we got to. And, and she prevails in prayer as well. And that was a hard process that didn't happen in a moment. But over the days, over the weeks, we did make that decision and we went back. And it was incredibly hard. And then it flourished into the best year we ever spent on the mission field, year two. Uh, we spent four years on a foreign mission field doing fruitful ministry, but man, we felt like our, we had our teeth kicked in. And that was extremely hard for us to do. She didn't want to do it. Uh, and I made the call. And we ended up going back, and it ended up being the right decision. But that was a hard thing for both of us, right? Guys, as we seek to love our wives and wives, as you seek to respect your husband, that means to revere, to follow. Understand that both of you are going to have extremely difficult time doing that. I know that's hard. I know that's difficult. Ephesians 5.33 reminds us of this. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Love your wife as yourself and wife, see that you respect your husband. What I am absolutely certain of is if we can follow God's plan for marriage, that we would have the faith to follow God in obedience to be able to do a marriage that would absolutely be loathsome in the mainstream, uh, in the mainstream sector. Would you agree that the mainstream out there, if you said this to just like a UCLA Berkeley student on a college campus, how would they react to these talking points? How terribly will I be maligned on YouTube for actually delivering this in a day and age where this kind of wisdom looks old school, patriarchal, abusive, misogynistic, all the, all the, the bad stuff that culture would want to levy at it. Don't you know that the wisdom of God is better than the wisdom of man? And how many of you are willing to take a scary step out in faith and say, you know what, though this is scary and it doesn't sit well with me, I'm going to follow my husband as leader and I'm going to encourage him as leader. I'm going to submit to my husband. Though the whole rest of the world or the whole rest of the United States would look at me like that is terrible. Try it. I dare you to try it and see what happens. Well, immediately what's going to happen is it's going to get really hard and you're not going to want to do it. You're actually going to have to put in a few miles to actually start seeing the fruit of what's going to happen. But for me, when my wife gives me that respect and she puts my leadership above what she actually wanted to do, it is the most awe-inspiring romantic thing ever. I remember, she, she's not good at grilling, she didn't like grilling, and I'd had a really long day, this was just a few weeks ago, and I was coming up from the bar because I did more chores, and I, it was quite a bit of them, and I was just exhausted, and she was over there fumbling on the grill. She's not good at grilling, she doesn't know what she's doing. And I looked at her, and she's just like, hello, <laughs> she said nothing. Uh, and she, I realized she wasn't going to ask me to take over, which made me want to. If she had sprung it on me, I'd be like, baby, I did not, I did not agree to grill. I just need to sit down. I need to rest. But I was amazed because I, I did this kind of little audit of myself of like, she's, she's not asking me to. And I'm like, I absolutely want to take over. It was so romantic of me. It was so awe-inspiring to me. So I've like immediately jumped in. I'm like, nope, I'm taking over this. Um, but I love that, uh, I love the romantic gesture of it all. I love that uh, when my wife respects me, when she wants to follow me, I mean, it is amazing how I immediately want to turn, uh, turn to her and give her the whole world. Try it. 
Try it. And, do, and let's just see if God doesn't unleash radical blessing in our marriages. Let me pray for us and I will close us out. This was a long sermon. I knew it would be. Next week will be a and ambush. Or I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I got my work job confused with my, uh, my preaching job here. So uh, we're going to do marriage Q&A next week. Should be fun, all kinds of uh, topics. So if you've had questions about today, you can fill this out on the card and I'll be able to answer it next week. Uh, so there's going to be a bunch of topics on. This was the hardest of the four, uh, four parts of the marriage series. So if you made it through today, congratulations. This was the hardest one. This was the one I saw coming down the pipeline. I'm like, oh, I got to tell people what the Bible says, but I don't want anyone to be mad at me. So this was challenging. Let me pray for us and I'll let you get out of here. King Jesus, I pray that you would help us in our marriages, that you would uh, convict us personally so that we are able to figure out how you want us to follow you, how you want us to love our spouse better, to respect our spouse better. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.